All right. So, hey everybody, welcome back. My name is my name is Jesse Le Cavalier. I'll be um, I'll be moderating the the second session about ground transport today. Um, and so as the as you can see in your your bios, I am an architect and. I've been doing research about logistics um, and how that relates to design and to land use and to urban design and to architecture and to how we live in cities. And, and so I'm really happy to be here and, and would, I'm super grateful for the, the opportunity to have worked with the Architectural League and with Rosalie uh, on, on this series of, of events. Uh, I think it's been really illuminating to try to bring all of these People together, so I'm really, I'm really thrilled to be here. And I, I wanted to, just, just in a kind of couple images, try to maybe highlight some of the things that I think might be illuminating to address this afternoon uh, through, through the presentations from, from Steve and Adam. And, and it starts maybe with a very fundamental question, which is, how does logistics change the way the city is shaped, or how does logistics shape the city? Um, Behind me is a kind of um, familiar image, probably, of, of our contemporary urban landscape, which is a container port. This is the port of Newark from above, and you can see this kind of logistical landscape behind you. And so I wanted to highlight just a few things um, that I think are salient about the logistics industry as a, as a body of work and as a way of knowing, and also kind of as increasingly as a, as a way of being in the world. Um, one of those things is that logistics tends to be both physical and and abstract. It's both digital and physical at the same time. Um, and that's so, for example, this is an image of, the, of an early barcode being, being composed for, to be photographed. And I like this image because it describes the way that information is thought of as both a, a thing to be used to translate other information, but then also, a, in this case, a physical Thing. So this is a kind of metaphor for a lot of the issues that logistics is dealing with. A lot of the tensions have to do with, with the, the balance between managing, imagining all of this stuff as pure information to be optimized and managed and allocated, and then the, the kind of really dumb physical reality of it as stuff to be moved around. And I think that same kind of abstraction spills out into the built environment. So this is an image from the 1980s from, a, from army logistics. But I like this image because it, I mean, these are, so for me, these are some of the mascots for, for my own thinking about this. Um, they've been really helpful images to, to think through the, the questions here. But this one, you can see the inventory that the dri person driving the forklift is, is moving around is, is shown in exactly the same way that the building in which that inventory sits is being moved around. Um, Sorry, in which that inventory is being moved around. So the, the idea that the building, the environment, the kind of enclosure get understood and managed in the same way that the inventory does, I think is also increasingly salient for the way we think about how cities are being understood as these entities to be optimized and abstracted and managed. So this is a little um, schematic, of course, but I think that we're, if you think about maybe these phases of, of different uh, technological histories from industrialization to mechanization and now maybe to automation or possibly even we could call it logistification. I think it's, it's possible to say that there's corresponding urban forms to those things uh, and that there's a kind of related development that's happened. So if you think about the industrialization of let's say England in the 19th century and the, the corresponding industrial city that emerged or the mechanical landscapes of, of, the, modern landscape, of the modern American landscape um, with, let's say, the auto industry. And then now I think the challenge of understanding what the automatic city looks like or the logistical city looks like, I think this is some of the things, these are some of the things we can talk about today. So just as a kind of, again, very schematic sort of shift, if you think about, let's say, the, the mechanized landscape of, of brake bulk shipping and the, the, the sort of semi-mechanical process of with cranes moving things off of boats and unloading them in the kind of image here on the, on the left of Manhattan and compare that to the more, um, even more uh, mechanized or even automated system of the, the container shipping of the port of Newark here where, where you see the, the financialized city in the distance where uh, the, 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 the bulk of all this stuff is happening uh, in the, the centralized and containerized 
uh, space of the port. So um, the last thing I wanted to, this is the last image, but just to say that we've, we, we heard, I think, this morning some really amazing descriptions about this relationship between the, the technological and the social and the, how these things are, are in constant sort of dialogue with each other in a, in a, a process of negotiation and renegotiation and pushing and pulling, and that it's not a sort of easy binary. And I, I like this image in the background. This is because it, for me, it talks about that relationship about how the infrastructure that we inhabit uh, is something that is also culturally constructed in a certain way. The way we use that is subject to agreement and subject to to uh, norms that are practiced and reestablished. So this is an image from um, 1967 in Stockholm when everyone stopped driving and shifted to the other side of the road because the Swedish government had decided it was time to start driving on the right. And so this is an image of that happening. And, and, and so um, I like this image a lot because it talks about the way that that the use of a kind of infrastructural system can be renegotiated in different ways. So with that, I'll turn it over to our first speaker, who is uh, Steve Vaselli, and then we'll hear from um, Adam Lamonsi from the city. So. Thanks, Jesse. So I'm a sociologist who studies the trucking industry and goods movement, and I've been doing that for about 12 years, and um, what I can tell you where I'm going to, you know, one of the things that I'm going to talk about today is the amount of change that's happening. And, and Jesse just put up some, some pretty powerful images, I think, of, of how the uh, spatial dynamics of freight has changed just in this, in this one city, right, in the movement from what used to be break bulk kind of docks to the kind of container sh uh, shipments that we see growing across the US today. And we are in a similar time of, of uh, rapid change that will fundamentally alter freight landscapes. There are really two, um, two things that, that I want to convince you of relative to transportation today, two, two simple points, which uh, are that one, we can't think of freight as the same as people. And oftentimes when we think about transportation policy and transportation infrastructure, we, we tend to start thinking about the people and then think about the freight movement. But they're, they're really quite different. And that's because of the second point that I, that I want to try to, I know it's kind of obvious, but I want to deepen maybe thinking about it, which is that freight movement is work. And so we need to conceptualize it from the perspective of work and the labor process um, behind it. OK, so if we look at freight movement today, we have um, some major skin in the game when we're thinking about climate change. Freight is a major uh, consumer of, of uh, diesel fuel in particular. And diesel, of course, is uh, quite dirty burning. So we have lots of environmental uh, concerns around the consumption of, of diesel fuel uh, relative to both climate change and the way that our cities uh, look and breathe today. And, and some of that, I think Jennifer was, was talking about uh, diesel particulates in particular uh, and, and asthma and the, and the key role that they play. Um, what we have today is a system where our oldest trucks, our dirtiest trucks are on the left here with our port drivers. Um, they're exactly where we don't want them, right? They are in uh, urban congested areas where they are burning uh, more diesel um, than more efficient trucks that are out on the road because we put the, uh, the newer, more reliable trucks further, dis you know, we send them further distances. Ports are where trucks come to die. It's also where we have our, some of our worst labor abuses. So we have lots of misclassified independent contractors, folks who often don't make minimum wage. Um, in contrast to that, we have some very good uh, unionized jobs that remain in less than truckload and in parcel, uh, jobs at places like UPS. And then we have what most of you probably think of when you think of a, a, a big truck driver, which would be our truckload long haul, or drivers that take you know, the bulk of, of consumer goods from um, manufacturing plants, container ports, lo over longer distances to distribution centers. And then, of course, we have our um, growing movement of, of last mile uh, delivery that I'll, I'll talk a bit about. And all of these have different ways of organizing the work of drivers, and those, and those ways of organizing the work have different implications for how we can make this industry more efficient. 
Um, now, how many of you out there believe that climate change is real? Raise your hand. Okay. And how many of you uh, think it's caused by, uh, by people, primarily? Okay. So this is not a trucking audience. <laughs> <laughs> I would have had to have a couple more slides in here. So when I talk to trucking audiences about this, I don't talk about climate change. I talk about efficiency. And the good thing is that, that truck drivers and trucking carriers really care about efficiency. Believe it or not, they really want to burn less diesel because that's one of their biggest costs. And so there's, there's, there's ground to work with them, but we have to think about the ways in which policy incentivizes them to not invest in the best technology. And that's, that's really what I want to talk about today. Okay, before we get there, as I said, it's a, this is a period of rapid change, and there are really four big areas where this, where this change is happening, one of which is around electrification, and this is an area that I've, I've done a bunch of, of work in, and, and right now I'm working with the state of California to think about the investments in, in clean trucks and, and other um, truck technologies that will allow the state to meet its climate goals, and essentially the labor impacts of, of those investments. But we have a tremendous interest from the industry in new technologies that can replace diesel and reduce the amount of diesel being used. We have digitization, which is basically Uber for freight, the same kind of matching process that you would, you would use to, to match passengers with a, a ride, uh, can be used for freight to match a load to an available truck, and we, can, we could have potentially much greater efficiency in the industry as a result of this. Of course, automation, self-driving trucks, which are on the horizon, are, are of major interest. And then e-commerce and last mile delivery. And of course, we all know that this is happening and this is rapidly changing the way that goods are moved through, the, through our, our, our economy. And this is you know, already transforming the trucking industry, changing the length of dis the distance that trucks are driving, the way distribution warehousing works, um, the demands from customers for transparency and speed, et, et cetera. So all of this together from the industry perspective suggests that you know, we're going to make these massive gains um, in, in efficiency. Right at the top there you have a, a self-driving truck and then uh, uh, below that Tesla's uh, electric truck. Um, and we're, we're looking into a future, they say, where we're going to have these autonomous trucks on the highways, electric trucks in our urban areas. And then, of course, digitization there that would allow um, drivers to be much more efficiently dispatched and get you your goods right, right to your door, right exactly when you want them, nice and safe and tidy with a smile. Now, what I would argue is that that sort of future is only going to happen if we have the right policies in place. And right now, we don't, we don't have those. Uh, uh, the, the industry right now, of course, operates primarily on public infrastructure, but um, externalizes a lot of its costs onto the public. Some of it's in air quality, some of it's in congestion, um, roadway and infrastructure damage, et cetera. And the reason that it's allowed to do that uh, is because we don't regulate the industry the way that we used to. In fact, we have very little regulation over the economics of the trucking industry. Um, and the way that it's been organized to produce services as cheaply as possible shifts a lot of those costs both to the public and to workers. So for instance, we have a lot of trouble keeping truck drivers out of congestion and policymakers are always asking me, you know, why the hell do these guys drive through congestion? Why don't they park and take a break? Um, we have to understand they're paid by the mile. Right? So the company is going to dispatch them through congestion because it, it's not paying them by the hour. It doesn't care if they move more slowly for the most part. Uh, and they're subject to hours of service regulations that prevent them from working, extending their workday. And so instead of you know, parking and taking a break, which would ultimately cost them in their paycheck, they, they are better off driving through congestion, for instance. If we don't change our policy, what we're going to end up with, potentially, uh, is the remain, uh, those dirty trucks remaining in the local area, autonomous trucks in the, uh, over the long distance if they're successful, right? and lots of misclassified um, local delivery drivers who are, um, at least in my area of South Philadelphia now, double parking in front of my house, you know, dropping my Amazon package on the stoop that gets stolen, right? uh, <laughs> et cetera. Right? So what we're going to end up with is something more like what we see today at ports, right? which is, um, you know, lots again, lots of misclassified workers who use the oldest and, and dirtiest burning trucks. Now, you know, why is that? 
Well, they, they don't have the capital uh, to invest in these trucks. They also don't have the kind of operation that might take advantage of, say, something like an electric vehicle. Uh, right now, the state of California is, is going to require and um, in, in the not too distant future, the use of zero emission vehicles at the port. Right now, th those vehicles don't exist. Uh, we, don't, we don't know exactly what they're gonna cost, but they could cost somewhere around 10 times as much as what the uh, trucks that are used today in ports cost. Right, so these, these trucks that you see there going into the port of LA uh, and Long Beach, uh, those may cost twenty, thirty thousand um, dollars a $30,000. An electric truck that could do comparable work to those could cost 250, 300,000, we don't know for sure. But this radically changes the economics of, of the distribution of, of freight in these areas. It's gonna mean that, you know, most likely adoption is gonna be hindered, unless of course the state, which the state of California is, is considering, subsidizes these trucks. So now the state might say kick in 200,000 to, to, to buy this truck. Unfortunately, the individual owner operator does not have employees, right? So that truck may then go and sit in front of their house in, instead of running maybe two shifts a day, which is what a larger company that would, um, that made that kind of capital investment would, would do with it, right? And so thinking about the ways in which the work is organized, the way that drivers are compensated, whether they're paid by the mile or by the hour, um, whether or not they are independent contractors or employees, is fundamentally important and actually should be where we start to think about how we make freight transportation um, more efficient. And of course, on the left here, uh, where, where we're gonna see the big growth in, in jobs over the next several decades is in last mile delivery. And uh, here we have a woman who may have packed the back of some uh, you know, hatchback or something like that with 20 or 30 packages from an Amazon distribution center um, and maybe 20 of those 20 such workers might replace the you know, UPS package van that comes around to your neighborhood, right? That's very efficiently routed, et cetera. Now, why, you know, why is that so bad for efficiency? Well, what's Amazon's concern in distributing those packages, right? It's their one or two hour or whatever next day delivery commitment that they've made to you. It may not be you know, reducing their fuel costs because they don't pay for that fuel cost, the independent contractor does, right? And so these issues are fundamental for thinking about how we, how we meet our climate change goals um, in, in the sector of freight movement. All right, so you know, we need to have a, a public policy framework that recognizes that freight movement is, is work, um, that good jobs oftentimes incentivize if more efficient outcomes. In fact, I would argue m uh, virtually all the time they tend to incentivize better outcomes. Uh, when we have bad jobs, most of the time we're shifting costs and inefficiencies onto workers. And uh, that gives companies less incentive to organize that work more efficiently. Um, and, and right now, uh, I, I often get into public debates with the, with the trucking industry about sort of whether or not they've kind of, uh, whether or not they're up to the task of meeting the challenges of automation, electric vehicles, et cetera. And, and their response typically is, don't, you know, don't worry, we've got this, you know, sort of thing, which is, you know, the trucking industry has been able to essentially self-regulate for, for decades now. Um, well, this is also the industry of, of course, many of you may know, sort of claiming a, a shortage of 100 plus thousand workers already, sort of cycles through, you know, tens of thousands of workers uh, per, per year. Um, and they, they don't have this, okay? This is public infrastructure, the use of it Right, is, is a concern, how it's used is a concern for all of us, and we're essentially letting them, letting them use it as they see fit, when instead we need to start thinking about proactive public policy uh, that would incentivize the, the kinds of outcomes that, that we really care about. And so what would those look like? Well, on the, on the, up in the upper right-hand corner, of course, we want to think about having some good jobs. We don't want a servant class in our cities that is, you know, uh, meeting the needs of, of online consumers of, of much greater means, right, who are absorbing the risk and, and costs of, of all, getting us all the goods that, that, we, um, that we want to have fast and cheaply. Um, the use of electric and alternative vehicles, uh, particularly electric in local areas, is something, of course, that has lots of, of public health and other kinds of benefits that, that we want to realize. Um, we're not going to be able to do that again unless we have companies that have the incentive to, to do that um, or we actually require, require those vehicles. 
And of course, we have the potential for much greater um, efficiency with autonomous trucks that could allow us to, um, to have more fuel efficient trucks in, in long distance hauling as well. So one of the public policies that I've proposed, um, and actually you can see down there, driverlessreport.org, this is a report that I did on the impacts of self-driving uh, trucks, but it also outlines this public policy proposal for a new kind of space that, that I think would, would help us to, um, to make freight movement uh, more efficient in terms of energy, but also less of a, a drag on our, on our infrastructure and our daily lives, which is this idea for an autonomous truck port, which would essentially be this space outside of congested urban areas where we would segment the duty cycle of trucks. Um, right now, we have technology on the shelf that could double the fuel efficiency of, of the average truck. The problem is that trucks have to operate in both urban and rural areas, right? So they offer, uh, uh, they operate both at slow speeds and high speeds. They stop a lot in urban areas, et cetera. Um, on the long haul segments, what you really want, where all your energy loss is, is to, aer it's to operate in the engine, which is a really good, important point to, to note that power plants are always gonna be more efficient than internal combustion engines. Uh, important thing to recognize for trucks as well. But beyond that heat loss to the, to the engine itself, um, we have aerodynamic drag and rolling resistance of the tires in the long haul. And so what we want there is a very streamlined kind of truck, right, potentially platooning, et cetera, um, that could be geared properly, have the right horsepower, et cetera, for travel at 60 miles per hour over, say, three, 400 miles. Um, does not, that truck doesn't brake very often, right? Doesn't make sense to have a hybrid there, a regenerative braking or something like that. Um, in contrast, in the urban area, right, where we have lots of stop and go, we would want an electric truck um, or potentially alternative fuels. But combining all those things on one truck, right, and using it into two different environments, obviously, reduces the return on investment of each of those, those technologies. So we should deliberately segment them. So we have autonomous trucks where we think they're gonna be available first. Uh, in this case, led by a human driver because that's a much easier technological fix and once we can double, triple the productivity of those drivers, it makes sense to have them there for safety purposes, open and close the doors, inspect the truck, fuel it, and do things like that. And then um, electric trucks in the, uh, in, the area, in the areas where we most want them, where we want that you know, cleanest burning, safest, you know, high visibility, et cetera, safest truck where we have traffic congestion. Again, these are the kinds of outcomes that the current organization of, of the trucking industry and the current regulation of it are not going to incentivize, that we're gonna actually need a public policy that says, you know, this is, this is what we want you to do on our, on our public roadways. Um, and of course, once we do that, once we get these trucks moving in and out of there and segment this duty cycle, then we could tell them things like, hey, it'd be much better if you didn't drive during congested hours, right, during rush hour, and maybe we'll give you a rebate on your fuel tax or something like that if you, if you move on off-peak times. Um, and that's the important thing about recognizing that freight is work rather than one of the most important things about it, rather than the kind of personal choice that people make to get to their job, um, is truckers generally have a lot of flexibility and they're doing it, you know, for their pocketbook. And so with relatively small incentives, um, and the ports of LA and Long Beach have proved this with their off-peak off movement of containers out of the port, uh, we can get a, a lot of freight, maybe most freight, off of the roads during congested periods of time. Uh, we can incentivize the movement of freight, you know, into the nighttime. Um, and when we think about a lot of our congested areas, as far as freight's concerned, most of them have two peaks a day, and they're, they're relatively underutilized the other, you know, maybe 18 hours of the day. Uh, we have extra capacity, and so when, when we think about, you know, the possibility of adding lanes or dedicated truck routes or things like that, um, we should first think about using the system that we have to its, to its full capacity. And, and from a freight perspective, we're, we're not even close to doing that yet. Okay, and I think that's, uh, that's all I have for you. Hi, my name is um, Adam Lamazny. I'm a senior project manager at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Uh, first, I want to thank you, Steve. That was a very uh, great presentation that I would love to use at my office sometime. Um, so I work for the EDC, and I'll explain kind of you know what we have to do with goods movement and freight particularly. Um, my job is essentially is a freight planner, 
what does that mean? Um, that's a good question. We're kind of like these uh, weird people that are kind of obsessed with logistics, asset management, transportation, that are kind of like urban planners, but not quite exactly. Um, but EDC's role um, is a little bit interesting. We um, actually uh, lead a lot of the freight planning initiatives on behalf of the city in conjunction also with the Port Authority and other city partners. Work a lot with uh, Jen's group who spoke earlier at the Sustainability Office and of course the Department of Transportation. Um, but our claim to fame is kind of we're like the city's landlord. Uh, we manage about 60 million square feet of property on behalf of the city. Um, a lot of it is actually uh, the ports and terminals, so container terminal um, out in Staten Island. The, uh, we own the land under the airports, both JFK and LaGuardia hold the master lease out to the Port Authority. Um, the Hunts Point Market in the Bronx, which is actually the largest um, produce wholesale market in the entire country. The city's helipads, so a number of different you know, ports and terminals. Um, in addition to EDC also administers city tax benefits um, and a lot of other initiatives. And our mission essentially is to um, create good jobs and build strong communities and freight is really a big part of that. Um, and just kind of setting that context, um, you know, when we talk about the freight transportation system, particularly in New York City and the region, like what are we really talking about here? And this map kind of illustrates what that is. Um, and you see that, you know, the biggest gateways are the seaports across the river um, in New Jersey, where, you know, Port Newark, uh, Port Elizabeth, the Mar Terminal, APM. Um, also, you see on Staten Island, New York State's largest container terminal. Um, and then we have actually ocean gateways in Brooklyn in the Red Hook Container Terminal, which was right here, uh, which we kind of co-manage with the Port Authority. Um, and actually also EDC oversees the new NYC ferry um, system and a lot of the city's waterfront. So this is kind of the universe we're talking about, and it's really talking about optimizing that and creating good jobs with that. And you know, with the jobs, for example, that's about 300,000 different freight-related jobs, which is related to manufacturing, wholesale, and, and transportation. Um, and just to kind of give a brief history of you know, how things work in New York City and why we got here, um, this is, a, I think, a pretty good slide that essentially describes the kind of the rise of New York City originally, you know, being connected to the Erie Canal, major shipping hub, you know, essentially built on transportation, um, great investments in the waterways, uh, the railroads, and then, of course, um, the creation of the bridges, the George Washington and the Verrazano. Um, and then in the 1950s, um, which is one of the greatest economic expansion projects, the creation of the National Highway System, a um, lot of, obviously, implications from that, but turned this economy very much into a trucking economy. Um, and as the population of New York City grew, a lot of this logistics activity moved out to uh, New Jersey and now actually spilling out into Pennsylvania to accommodate for growth. But that's actually presented us with some interesting challenges. Um, mainly, it's you know, on the inbound freight movement by volume, it's really 90% of all the goods that we're receiving here come by truck. Um, and that's, that's a high number, and you know, remember everything we get at the end of the day does come off the end of a truck, but also consider that most other major metropolitan areas um, actually have only about a 70% uh, mix of um, inbound movements by truck. A lot of it's actually substituted by rail. Um, and what makes New York interesting, of course, is it's an archipelago. Um, and one of the major issues is the major gateways for New York City are the George Washington Bridge in Verrazano, and basically all the freight, trucking, cargo that we get, all the Amazon packages, all the construction materials, our food, all comes basically on cheap choke points. And that's also the same for Long Island. So that we're really talking about you know, 11 million plus people that are getting all of their goods just on truck. And over the years, you see kind of disinvestment in the railroads that have gone to New Jersey where they terminate. Um, in the shipping industry, you know, still being very strong, but moving across the Hudson presents a lot of logistical challenges that you just don't see anywhere else in the United States. Um, and so we're also talking about demand. There's questions about that, you know, what's going to happen? USDOT predicts about a 45% increase in freight demand for the country over the next couple, you know, 20, by 2045. Um, but we're actually in New York City projecting about 68%. And then also to talk about New York City in context, you know, it's not a city of alleyways. Everything here is very manual. Um, I work down in lower Manhattan and you see the delivery trucks parked on the sidewalk. You, you know, you see the UPS guy or you see a freight person with the parcels and the packages kind of making a mini warehouse on the street. We're all kind of annoyed by this, but there's nowhere else to go. Um, and although the outer boroughs have a little more space, there's a lot of similar challenges, lack of places to park trucks. So it kind of begs the question, you know, what can the city do and EDC do, you know, with its assets to kind of help along with this process to plan for future growth in addition to the current problems we have today. 
Um, so, um, you know, to our pride, we actually released a plan that represents about $100 million in investment uh, this July uh, with the de Blasio administration. Um, Congressman Jerry Nadler is a big supporter of, of freight movements and investments in freight and freight-related jobs in the city. Um, and really, the strategy is talking about investments, and I'll briefly go over them, in, in uh, the railroads, uh, maritime, um, distribution, and kind of taking more, much more of an active role. As Steve was saying, where we've kind of, you know, kind of let the private market do its thing over time, but trying to take a more active role in crafting how we're receiving our goods and controlling our destiny, so to speak. Um, and so this initiative, again, is about $100 million, and it's really also about a jobs creation play. So we think we're going to, over the next 10 years, create about 5,000 good-paying jobs in the freight logistics industry. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about what that means, too. And just to give a, you know, a brief overview, we really took more of a comprehensive supply chain overview of this. So where the Department of Transportation you know, has a freight mobility unit, they're very concerned about you know, last mile delivery, curbside access, and these kinds of issues, and street design, which, by the way, we're also concerned about. And also, I'll say this is a very exciting opportunity for me to talk to architects about freight. It's not something that's really discussed too much, even in the urban planning circle. So this, this is a good time to talk about this. Uh, as you can see, I'm kind of excited about it. Um, but the kind of the crux we're talking about is, is investments in maritime and what does that mean? Um, essentially, it's talking about short, short sea shipping routes, short sea shipping. I, I practiced that 20 times before I got here and I said it. Um, and what does that mean, barges, essentially? Um, and so now we have a number of initiatives that we're looking at actually constructing a marine terminal up in the Bronx where the food distribution center is. It's never actually been, although it's on a peninsula um, on water, it's never been accessible by water. And we'd like to see a lot of those inbound movements for um, deliveries to the distribution center before they're going to the final destinations to be actually carried by a barge. Um, and these are for not, you know, not the super perishable commodities like fish, but this is things like water. This is things like, um, you know, that are a little less time sensitive, very bulky. And, you know, we're looking at trends in the industry, um, maritime, you see these larger ships, a lot of them are over capacity uh, or have, you know, excess capacity, but they're also dropping more containers at these terminals and they're being, and the terminals are not equipped for this. I mean, they're becoming very efficient, but we no longer have the space to build out like some other terminals do on the east and west coast. So you see kind of, you know, a flood of container activity. It's very difficult for the truckers to go in there because they have massive delays trying to get containers in and out. And so it begs a question. Should we be moving all this stuff by a truck? Um, if something, if Poland Springs or a large company that's shipping water or something very heavy from Maine sending you know, hundreds of trucks down, isn't there another way to do this? Um, and so recently we've actually been working with the Port Authority um, to convene a lot of ports along the Atlantic with terminal operators and shippers to see how to kind of really change some of the underlying economics to get this thing moving. Um, particularly with the railroads, um, you know, we were talking about a lunch today, it's pretty interesting because on this side, um, on the East Coast, the, the railroads are really owned by, um, you know, Amtrak and the passenger um, companies, which is great for us passengers, whereas on the West side, really, of the country, it's all the freight railroads, it's their property. Um, and so, well, it's good, well, most cases, it's good to be a passenger here, but it's tough for freight because they have to manage this. There's complex leasing agreements, there's limited time slots. In New York City, you know, they have to deal with Long Island Railroad, there's different slotting considerations that make it very tough to move more freight by rail. And some of this is actually pretty simple. Um, they operate on single track roads, so why not build, you know, essentially an extra lane for truck, or sorry, trucks, for trains to be able to um, pass by have lay down space and be able to transload materials was just a fancy way of saying bringing in say construction materials into the city um, and transporting them for a final mile delivery by a truck and really this is getting at eliminating vehicle miles traveled we're never going to completely get rid of a truck movement until we can teleport all of our goods um, but we really don't want you know trucks coming in um, for the full trip when they don't have to be um, and the last two i want to talk about briefly too something we're looking at freight hubs um, and really talking about the importance of industrial activity. Uh, that's something that's, you know, it's always a long ongoing conversation, but as you get more people, they demand more things. And while we need, um, you know, space for affordable housing, we need space for parks, we need space for hospitals, we also need space to accommodate our freight deliveries and where our goods are getting. And one of the biggest issues we see today is, you know, most of this warehousing activity, the big box, so to speak, is out in New Jersey and it's pushed out to Pennsylvania. And 
I was at a trucking conference not that long ago, and they were talking about you know, efficiencies that you see in retail um, are not being translated over to the trucking industry. And what that really means is retail companies, have, because of the just-in-time uh, model, have basically pushed all their inventory onto truck, trucking companies to have more trips, which costs more, creates more vehicle miles traveled, and you know, if there's no warehouses to receive these goods uh, in the cities, these big trucks essentially, you know, they operate as roving warehouses. They make extra stops. They're blocking the corners and creating a lot of the congestion issues that we see. So we would like to see spaces for modern distribution warehouses where, a, you know, say a large 53-foot truck can come into the city with one trip, drop off its goods, exit the city, and leave the last final mile deliveries to, you know, smaller vehicles that have better routes. And frankly, the trucking industry would like this better because it means more turns for them, means, um, you know, more dollars. And then Jen was talking a little bit earlier about some of the electrification and clean trucking um, initiatives that we're pushing. Um, and what that means is, you know, looking at strategic properties that maybe EDC controls where we can be installing, say, EV infrastructure, but also alternative fueling infrastructure like natural gas um, and leveraging our relationships with the various tenants we have. Um, so also to give a little bit of perspective, um, you know, on this kind of warehousing phenomenon I was talking about, this map is essentially showing, it's kind of a zoning overlay. Um, and you see the yellow is predominantly residential. Um, you see some of the parkland. Uh, blue and the purple essentially represent industrial zones, but the blue are actually warehouses. And you see clusters, really the remaining clusters of industrial development in the city, which you see Sunset Park in Brooklyn, Maspeth in Queens, which is actually one of the biggest distribution hubs for, for Manhattan. You see it up in the Bronx, particularly Hunts Point. Um, and then Staten Island, of course, which actually Amazon, for the first time, is coming into the city on Staten Island. Um, but you see on the left towards New Jersey, a lot of this activity as well along the I-95 corridor. But what this map doesn't show is the size of those warehouses in New Jersey, which are the very large box things we're talking about. We're in New York City, and this is where the you know, conversation about architecture and design and with the, the cityscape gets interesting, because how do you make, if we can't design, or we have no space for a 500,000 foot square house, or even 200, even 100,000 square foot warehouse. So now it's the industries looking at, do we go vertical? Do we go underground? How do we accommodate for that? Um, and it's just kind of showing to you you know, when you're squeezing out industrial space, you don't have the ability to, um, you know, accommodate these kind of uses and for growth. It makes it very important. Um, and again, this goes back to supply chain competitiveness of jobs. And this is really adapting to industry-driven trends for just-in-time um, deliveries. And, you know, as the supply chains are getting closer to where we live, we're demanding goods now in this, you know, very short window and time frame. How do you accommodate for that? And a lot of these issues, you know, we're seeing manifested in what Steve was talking about with trucking. There's nowhere to park. You know, where do they go? Um, how do you accommodate for that? And, uh, you know, one of the interesting things about trucks, for example, is you see a lot of them parked on the side of the road because there's nowhere to go. And uh, it's a you know it's a big community issue. It's a safety issue. But even when we say we want to ticket the the trucks, um, you know the cops can't take them anywhere because there's nowhere to go. So how do we deal with that as we do new builds and designs? Um, so you know in terms of sustainability, I think a lot of us know this, but you know shifting things over to maritime and rail is really reducing the amount of vehicle miles that are being traveled, particularly regionally, and it's creating more efficient movements in the city. Um, and you see this actually happen a lot in, in Southeast Asia with newer, you know, newer builds on economies they plan for this. You see in parts of Europe where there's more consolidation centers. And this doesn't work for every type of business model. Logistics is a big, you know, almost somewhat controlled chaos. It's a big mess. It, you know, it's amazing that it works and not every model works for everybody. But as the population increases, um, it just puts far more constraints on our land. Um, so, you know, how do we take advantage of this? Um, you know, particularly on the maritime side, to get some of the benefits is you can take more cargo on maritime is the truck driver shortage, as Steve was talking about. Is it a shortage in the physical numbers? Not really. It's more in the qualified drivers, um, you know, trucking companies, and partly because of safety considerations are picky, but there's going to, in terms of who they hire, but there are going to be issues in the future 
Um, there's less miles traveled, so you know, looking how we can leverage our local maritime assets on waterways to move some of these goods, and again, trying not to cannibalize the current jobs that happen in the trucking industry. And as we've talked to the industry, a lot of them are actually in favor of this, just because you make things more efficient for the current businesses operating, but shift of the, this goods movement to the maritime. Um, and then also, the city's you know very active in cleaning its own fleet. The city has about 29,000 vehicles, um, and they have very ambitious goals to add about 2,000 new electric vehicles to the fleet um, in, you know, in the 80 by 50 plan reduction of emissions. And um, one of the things I mentioned is EDC, we tend a lot of properties. Um, we have, for example, the Brooklyn Army Terminal, um, which is a fascinating building down in Brooklyn, about a four million square foot campus. Um, and we have a lot of other industrial tenants. And you know, a story that we had before was, you know, essentially the exchange we give to a business is you get lower rent from us. And we're really looking at how can we kind of integrate policy uh, goals with this. So one example was it was a very large distributor of um, beverages you know, several years ago that was getting a pretty good deal on city lands. So we said, okay, we'll renew your lease, but in exchange for that, your fleet, which is a very substantially large one in the city, needs to be converting its uh, vehicles over to uh, natural gas or a low emission um, you know, type of vehicle. And a lot of those, you know, are on the market and that's something they've actually been doing over time as, you know, fleet managers convert their fleets over. So we kind of have some ability to leverage that, which is interesting that not, you know, many other city agencies do. So that's something we're looking at, you know, moving forward. Um, and then, you know, the future, what does this look like? And I think this gets really interesting because as I mentioned, warehouses, you think of the typical just gigantic box that's put somewhere um, and industry likes that. They want to be on one floor. They want to have many loading bays, um, but that's just not an option here. So this is a this is a picture you can see. This is the Brooklyn Army Terminal I was talking about. <coughs> um, this building was originally constructed in 1918 by the federal government for it was a staging ground for all the troops that went out uh, in World War One to the Atlantic Theater and also World War Two. Elvis deployed out of here. There's a picture of that in there if you're interested. Um, and when containerization was created. <coughs> This kind of eliminated the need for this building because it's a very old school vertical development um, and it's not efficient for modern day containerization. So the city was given um, charge of tenanting it and now today it's actually an interesting campus where there's a lot of light manufacturing going on. But also what we're doing is uh, RFPing a piece of land that's just immediately um, next to those two buildings, which is a large parking lot, and we're looking at you know, developing a multi-story distribution center that's job intensive. And so one of the things we're thinking about the city is what does this look like? You know, no one's really interested in having a big box on the street. The community's not interested in that. Um, how does it blend in with the streetscape? You know, how you know, does it relate to the bike network that's there? There's a lot of different uses that are happening in this particular neighborhood, some of them commercial, some of them retail, but at the end of the day, it's an industrial neighborhood. Um, this is a good use for that. And there's also the multimodality. This is next to a rail yard that we manage um, with a cross harbor float. Uh, so it's literally a barge that comes across from New Jersey with rail cars on it that connect here and that goes out to New York and actually has connections out to Long Island. And how can we replicate more models like this? Um, so I think we'll probably get into this a little bit in the panel, but you know, just kind of things to think about. <clears throat> you know, this is something we clearly need. It's good for jobs. It's good for the economy. It it you know meets demand that's going to be here. It's coming. So what do these things look like? And again, it's you know I think it's going to be multimodal uh, connections. It's going to be better integration with the roadway. Um, and it's really accelerating the adoption of alternative fuels and electric fuels because there's certainly you know, an operator that would come in here, you know, it's next to a residential zone. You know, what tools and what leverage do we have in the pre-development um, pre you know, um, stage where we can say, okay, you're operating in here, but the kind of vehicles you're operating out of here and your outbound deliveries need to be green, um, you know, whether that's electric or natural gas, et cetera. Um, so those are some of the things you know, I think are really interesting to think about. And particularly with warehousing, you know, we talked about uh, multi-story warehouses a few years ago and, you know, we kind of got laughed out of the room um, because it's like you have industrial development. It's not, you know, it's, it's very important, but it's not as high revenue as, you know, an office or some commercial development. And now you see these developers that historically have stayed in the commercial retail, even residential space the market is super hot for this industrial space. So where do we put it? 
Are there incentives involved for this? Do we, you know, have the private market deal with this pricing and the economics on its own? Do we, you know, do we assist with that? It's a lot of open questions that are very interesting. So it's a very interesting space to be um, right now. So um, I think if anything in this presentation, I would just like to talk, you know, the future of what does this industrial development look like? I think it's very different, and I pre think it presents a lot of really great opportunities. Um, but also, you know, leveraging our multimodal connections and how can we shift a lot of this truck movement and accommodate for future growth. Um, so that's what I have, and thank you very much for listening.